Step 2. Canonical quantization. Let's begin to describe the general procedure of how to go from a description of a physical system using classical mechanics to describing it using quantum mechanics, known as the canonical quantization. So imagine that we have a general system of n particles. In classical, um, classical mechanics, what we do is we write them out as a set of two n dynamical variables. The first n variables are denoted q1, q2, up to qn, and the other n variables are p1, p2, all the way up to pn. The q's are known as the positions of the particles, while the p's are known as the momenta. So knowing the position of every particle in your system, you know where it is. Momenta give you information where it is moving, in which direction, and at what speed. And using this, you can then apply first-order differential equations of time to find the position at any later time. In particular, what you do is you write the energy of the system, known as the Hamiltonian, which we denote by h. And this h is generally a variable of all of your q's and all of your p's, so all of your positions and all of your momenta. And these q's and p's, they've got a special name. They're known as the canonically conjugate variables, qj and pj. And they will pl play a crucial role in the canonical quantization process. And how do you find the evolution of your system? You apply the Hamilton's equations of motion, but only if you have canonically conjugate variables. So, your positions obey the following equation. The change in time of your position qj depends on the right-hand side here. You just take the Hamiltonian and you differentiate it with respect to pj, and that will give you the evolution of your position qj. Similarly, how does the momentum of particle j evolve in time? Well, that's given over here. It's the negative, that's very important, of the partial derivative of your Hamiltonian h with respect to qj. Now, what do we do in quantum mechanics? It's actually very simple once you know the canonically conjugate variables in your corresponding classical system. You take your classical system, described by the dynamical variables, q1 up to qn and p1 up to pn, and you promote these variables to not be just scalars, but to be quantum operators. We denote it by putting these little hats over your variables, just to make sure that we mean that they are quantum operators. And the crucial important thing is that these operators obey the following canonical commutation relation. The commutator of qj and pk is equal to the following quantity. It's ih bar times delta jk, where the commutator is defined as the following. So the commutator of some operator a and some operator b is given as a times b minus b times a. So immediately we see that the order in which the operators are acting is important. We cannot just interchange it. In particular, if we have k equal to j, so delta jk is equal to 1, we see that qj times pj minus pj times qj is equal to i h bar. This is important. If there's one thing that you remember from the first step, this must be it. So, the order of operation matters, as we said. And this will have huge consequences for many observables, as we will see in the next couple of lessons. Again, we go, how do we describe energy in a quantum system? We take our classical Hamiltonian, which is a function of two to the n dynamical variables, and we just put hats on all of its dynamical variables. So now the Hamiltonian is a function of all of these quantum operators. And the evolution of the system is given by the Schrodinger equation, which you must have heard from your basic quantum mechanics course. And it's given by the following. It's i h bar times the time derivative of this ket psi is equal to the Hamiltonian times the ket psi. The ket psi is the state vector describing your system. And in principle, you can obtain any observable from this uh, state vector. And the time evolution depends only on the Hamiltonian. So you see that the Hamiltonian plays a crucial uh, part in describing the evolution of the system and the state vector as well. 
Now, this was extremely formal. So, let's consider a simple example. Let's start with a particle moving in one dimension under the influence of some potential given by Vx. What are our canonically conjugate variables? They are q is equal to x, so our uh, canonical position is just given by this one-dimensional position coordinate x, and the canonically conjugate momentum is equal to m times dx by dt. Now you may wonder, how did I choose these particular coordinates to be my q and my p? There is in fact a general procedure how to do it using Lagrangian mechanics, but that's not really important for this discussion that we are trying to have here. But it, this procedure can be found in many uh, advanced classical mechanics textbooks. But one way to check that you have uh, classical uh, conjugate variables is by the following. You write down the classical Hamiltonian, which is given by the kinetic energy, p squared over 2m, plus the potential energy given by Vx. And you check whether your Hamilton's equations give you reasonable results. So let's check that. Let's compute the change in our uh, position q. dq by dt is, as we said, given by the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian h, h with respect to p. And if we, if we do the, the, uh, the uh, partial derivative, it gives us p over m. Similarly, how does our momentum change in time? Well, that's just given by minus dh by dq, and we see that this, that is given by minus dv by dx. If you remember your course on classical mechanics, you immediately recognize this as Newton's equations of motion. So, by taking these two, q and p, these, we can check that they are in fact canonically conjugate variables because applying them into Hamilton's equations, we recover known results from classical mechanics. So now we are ready to quantize our system. And again, what do we do? We simply take our classical Hamiltonian h and we put a hat over everything. So now our quantum Hamiltonian uh, h with a hat is given by the following expression, where the uh, uh, quantum operator for the momentum p and the quantum operator for position x satisfy the following commutation relation. And we can, uh, we can calculate the dynamics in position representation. And again, you can go to any uh, textbook on quantum mechanics where you will find that the operator x in position re uh, representation is nothing but multiplication uh, x times, while the operator p can be written as minus i h bar times a differential operator, the partial differential operator, d by dx. And when you substitute it back into your Hamiltonian and then plug it into uh, the Schrodinger equation, you find the following equation that you have to solve. Any in your quantum mechanics courses, you will solve this equation and again and again for different types of potential, uh, potential functions vx. For example, you will do pot uh, potential well or you will apply to hydrogen atom. So this is an example where uh, we applied the canonical quantization. In the next step, we will study one of the most simple, uh, simple physical systems, the simple harmonic oscillator. See you there.